After a week of criticism, CIA Director Gina Haspel briefed a select group of senators on the Saudi Crown Prince's role in the murder of Washington Post journalist Jamal Khashoggi. Senators leaving the meeting say the intelligence community's assessment is clear. There's not a smoking gun, there's a smoking saw. It is zero chance, zero, that this happened in such an organized fashion without the Crown Prince. If he was in front of a jury, he would be convicted in 30 minutes uh, uh, guilty. Now joining us now is Republican Senator Marco Rubio. He was not part of that briefing, which we'll get to in a minute, Senator, but obviously you know Senator Graham and Senator Corker and the other senators who were in there who all came out with that universal message. What we heard is that the Crown Prince is responsible. What's your reaction? Well, let me say, first of all, I, uh, I'm on the U.S. Senate Intelligence Committee, so everything they knew, whatever they learned in that meeting, we've known. Uh, and, and I'm not going to discuss classified information other than to tell you that I don't, frankly, think you need to get that far. Just from what we know about Saudi Arabia, what we know about the Crown Prince, and what we know about this murder, leaves you with no doubt that the Crown Prince, at a minimum, knew about it and condoned it, and perhaps, uh, at worst, was actually involved in directing it. And here's why we know that. He has absolute control in Saudi Arabia. He basically governs the country at this point as the crown prince. The 17 people who flew into Turkey has now been publicly reported who they are. Uh, many have very close ties to him. There is no way, and I mean no way, that 17 people that close to the crown prince get on a charter airplane, fly into a third country, murder someone in a, in a diplomatic facility, and fly back to Saudi Arabia, and he not at least know about it, uh, much less uh, perhaps be involved in it. And I think you can conclude that without having been in that briefing or without sitting on the Intelligence Committee the way I do. It says, you say it leaves you with no doubt, no doubt. Then how do you explain what I'm about to play? The President, the Secretary of State, and the Secretary of Defense. Listen to this. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't. They did not make that assessment. The CIA has looked at it, they've studied it a lot, they have nothing definitive. Nobody's concluded. I don't know if anyone's going to be able to conclude that the Crown Prince did it. We have no smoking gun that the Crown Prince was involved. There's no direct evidence linking him to the murder of Jamal Khashoggi. So are Secretary Pompeo, Secretary Mattis, the President of the United States, Senator, are they being straight with us? Well, I think they're, frankly, carrying out the policy of the administration. And uh, I think they're, to, it, let me point to you this way. We don't need smoking gun evidence. This is not a criminal trial. This is not an episode of Matlock, okay? But, well, this is, or, 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 you know, any of these other shows on television. This is American diplomacy. I can tell you we know more than enough, just from what you know and from what everybody knows regarding what's happening in Saudi Arabia, who these people were and what happened, uh, to conclude that he had to know about it and he was involved in it. I mean, Saudi Arabia is not some decentralized government that operates, you know, without, uh, with all sorts of people acting independently. Everything there is very tightly controlled. As far as the White House and their position is concerned, it is my view that they are trying to preserve, from a realistic perspective, the importance of the Saudi-U.S. Uh, uh, alliance, which I agree with. It is a critical one. But all alliances have buffers. All alliances have limits. And the Crown Prince will continue to test the limits of this alliance until those limits are clearly set. Are we setting any limits? Well, I think privately we probably have. I'm pretty confident. I don't know that for sure, but I, I believe we have based on, on what I know. I, I do think there needs to be some public uh, actions taken as a result of this. Things cannot continue the way they are. And I think I, I detailed last week on a floor speech very specific asks and things that we should be asking for. And it ranges from human rights issues such as freeing those women prisoner, as w women that have been taken prisoner for political reasons, uh, freeing Raif uh, Badawi, who's, who's been jailed, again, for speaking out about the, the authoritarian nature of the Saudi regime. And then I think going beyond it, I think there are other things that we should consider. The, the one, two, three agreements uh, should be postponed on nuclear, on, on nuclear energy and, and enrichment and the like. There are all sorts of things that we can do to make clear that this can't continue to happen. Otherwise, he's going to continue to get more reckless and continue to push more boundaries. He's going to, he's going to frankly, uh, pull us into a war one day with some recklessness. You did, though, vote against defunding the Saudi effort in Yemen. Why? Because it has nothing to do with this particular case. It's the wrong way to do the right thing. Uh, I can outline to you the reason why we should be involved with the Saudis there. First and foremost, we've already... First of all, I don't believe the War Powers Act is constitutional. Second, even if it were, I don't believe that it, what we are doing with Saudi Arabia rises to the limits of triggering the War Powers Act. 
Third, I think it's in our national interest to be engaged the way we are. If we stop arming them, they're not going to stop the war because they view that as the, and rightfully so, the Houthis are Iranian agents at this point, or surrogates, and they're being surrounded by Iran. This would now be a southern blank. The second thing I would do is, if we stop supporting the Saudis, you're going to see an increase in the Houthis' attacks against Saudi Arabia. And I mean uh, strikes with UAVs and strikes with rockets that could actually kill civilians and even members of the royal family, and that's only going to trigger a larger response. And before you know it, there's an all-out shooting war, I mean, beyond just this proxy war, not to mention the threat the Houthis pose to the shipping lanes uh, that lead to the Indian Ocean, where all this oil and energy for the world goes through every single day. We could get pulled into that as well. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of reasons why voting for that is a bad idea, and I don't think you have to vote for that to do something about what happened with Khashoggi. All right, I, I understand your position on the Yemen vote. If we can, though, I want to go back to something you said before about Secretary Pompeo and Secretary Mattis. You said they're just carrying out the policy of the administration. That feels like you are giving them a pass for saying something you just told me you believe not to be true. Well, I think if you just read, again, I'm not going to get into analyzing intelligence or anything of that nature, especially on, on national television. I'm going to tell you that I think you can argue that from a technical perspective, people can be saying things that are accurate. But the reality of the situation is I disagree with what they're saying in terms of the theme of what they're laying out. Again, yeah, but you also they work for the president. Yeah, I don't, I don't, look, I, yeah, but uh, no, again, again, you also just said, because I've been listening to your words very carefully, you're worried that the Saudi crown prince could drag us into a war. And you right. also argue that the public words here matter. In, in those public do. words that they said are very specific. But again, if, you know, I would wish that the administration's position was different. And, uh, and you'll have to ask Secretary Pompeo and Secretary uh, Mattis the questions about why they've used that phraseology and why they've taken the position they've taken. I'm neither excusing it. I'm making an mm -hmm. observation. I disagree with that assessment. I think most people that have seen it, and I, I'm telling you this, it's not based on intelligence. We don't, I right. don't need intelligence. I think you know enough and the American public knows enough about Saudi Arabia and about this murder to conclude that w whether or not we have a smoking gun, there is no way that 17 people that close to that crown prince Go to, go to Turkey and murder a guy at a consulate and he not know about it and he not be okay with it, period. Uh, Senator, if I can, I want to get your take on some of the developments over the last 24 hours. We saw the sentencing memo regarding the former National Security Advisor, Michael Flynn. I just want to read you one part of that, that that jumped out to me. It said, the defendant's extensive government service should have made him particularly aware of the harm caused by providing false information to the government as well as the rules governing work performed on behalf of the government. Michael Flynn should have known better. What do you see there? Well, I'm on the, again, I'm on the Intelligence Committee. We mm -hmm. continue with our probe. It involves a lot of the same people, a different take on it, but we're not a criminal justice entity. But so I usually refrain from commenting on specifics around the case until our report is ready. You know, okay. I don't think we should prejudge one way or the other. But I will continue to say this. I think it is important and it is in the best interest, quite frankly, of the administration and of the American people. That, that, that Mr. Mueller be allowed to complete his probe and put out all the evidence out there. If people are criminally charged, that some have been already, they'll have their day in court, there'll be the presumption of innocence. But let's let this thing work itself through. I, I get it, I know you guys have mm -hmm. to cover the news and we all have to respond to the news every day about what's out in these filings. But let's wait for the complete picture to be out there. I think that's in the best interest of everyone as, this, uh, as Mueller continues his work. Yeah. Let's wait for him to finish and then we'll look at the whole thing and, and then we can opine. And, and, uh, and obviously the U.S. Senate Intelligence Committee is going to have a role to play as well with our report. Look, that's fair. We're not jumping the gun here by asking you something that came out publicly in a release overnight. I just wanted to get your take on it. I do appreciate, though, you are on the Intelligence Committee. You're not going to comment on that. Also, just today, it, it is a national day of mourning, and there will be a state funeral for, for former President George H.W. Bush. I just want to get your moment of reflection on the former president. You know, it was the first person I ever voted for for president back in 1992, and now, I, as, uh, I've always had an interest in foreign policy, uh, living in Florida, living in Miami in particular, foreign policy often is our domestic policy too. And I just look back at the first Gulf War and it was a work of, it was a masterpiece of foreign policy. You look at the coalition that George H.W. Bush put together to oust Saddam Hussein, the way it was done, the use of international entities to, to rally international support. I don't know if that's possible given the world today, but what he did back then combined with managing sort of the end of the Cold War. What I remember, I was in college at the time, it was just, it looked like, you know, the world had just been transformed overnight. I grew up in an era where we were worried we were gonna get bombed by the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union was gone. 
And then the U.S. carried out the, this coalition that, that ousted them quickly. It was just a masterpiece of foreign policy. And it was, you could see the, all the accumulated years of experience at the CIA as vice president. Um, all, all these things come together uh, to, to allow him to lead us in a, in a way that, that few, of any, could. And you've also noted his humility and dignity are a strength, not a weakness. Senator Marco Rubio, we do appreciate you being with us this morning. Thanks so much. Thank you.